Jews, and in this case with Europe, the creation of Europe with Brussels, with this new central power of a newly constituting state in this fascinating process of state building before our very eyes. As you know from history, all state building processes are very painful. Inevitably, there are clear winners and clear losers, and the losers do not fade easily. The debate about a European identity, about Europe's constitution, about what will constitute the soul, the flesh, and the blood of this new entity, never mind the skeleton which is not now, now being gradually put into place, has not even begun yet. We have no idea what shape it will take, where it will go, who will lead it, who will in fact be the winners and losers. What is clear, however, is that people are worried. And this, of course, often leads to a kind of scapegoatism or, again, a major debate about modernity. Everything that I said about Europe, this next point, also pertains to the whole issue of globalization a process that had been with us, of course, certainly since the advent of capitalism and the discovery of the Americas in the 16th century, and that's had many more vastly greater leaps in the history, in his, its history than the one that we're currently experiencing, some of which, like the one between 1890 and 1920, changed human existence much more profoundly than anything that we are currently witnessing. You know, Fordist mass production, antibiotics, the radio, women entering the public sphere, and so on and so forth. Of course, with this huge modernization push between 1890 and 1920, what was the response? The response, of course, was fascism, the age of fascism as we know it. And again, uh, the, the debate was that over mod modernization, ab 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 about major displacement, about modernity. And again, I think that's also a debate now about globalization or so-called globalization. By the way, parenthetically, the best thing still written on globalization in Marx's Communist Manifesto. Uh, it's all clearly dele uh, delineated there about capitalism's globalizing powers. It's not new. It really starts with the 16th century. Europe's multiculturalism. This has a number of dimensions. The simple fact that as a consequence of post-Yalta world, borders have opened up and population shifts have occurred that Europeans never expected and that exacerbated the earlier immigration waves of the 1960s and 70s, which these states could contain under the aegis that these workers were only guest workers or temporary. Uh, two weekends ago, we had the great conference of uh, Europeanists in Chicago, and we had a wonderful session on immigration in Europe, and which a couple of people showed how the immigration in the 90s, right after the end of the, uh, the Soviet Union is profoundly qualitative and quantitative, completely different from the ones that started in the 50s and 60s where you had sort of certain workers that were imported. Suddenly, the multiculturalism that these Europeans enjoyed in terms of the growing diversity of the culinary possibilities, you know, it's nice to go to a Greek restaurant, mutated into a very nasty contest over identity, citizenship, permanence, language, ethnicity, religion, in other words, the hot buttons of politics. The empirical reality that a large number of these immigrants hailed from the Muslim world, Turkey, but also the Arab countries and Iran and Germany, the Maghreb, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco and France, Pakistan and the Arab world in Britain, Kurds in Sweden, Albanians in Italy, Moroccans in Spain, while all these immigrants awakened first and foremost a nasty strain of xenophobia and racial hatred in all European countries against themselves, they also triggered a massive reemergence of anti-Semitism in a twofold way. First, on the part of those who hate these newcomers, the Muslim newcomers, and wish them ill. This is the old style European anti-Semitism, or you said of your father's anti-Semitism. But also second on the part of those who are targets of this hatred, who happen to be from cultures where anti-Semitism has, has attained a major presence, mainly, though not exclusively, by dint of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It is not that Muslim anti-Semites and German or European anti-Semites suddenly discover their mutual love for each other, although that has happened, too. Indeed, what is very interesting, is in the last two years, for the first time, we have sort of fascist internationals, which if you know anything about fascism, is, of course, a contradiction in terms because, of course, it heightens nationalism. You can't be, that's the whole idea. You're particularly, in, 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 it's, like a, it's, it's chauvinist. Chauvinist in the, and by the way, in both senses of the term. Uh, in, your, in the new sense of the term that, of course, it disdains and hates women, but also in the old sense of the term that it's hyper-nationalistic. But in the hierarchy of hatreds, which all people have, or dislikes, but in this case, anti-Semitism has yet another voice 
okay, in, where indeed, in this case, let's say German and other anti uh, 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 expressed themselves in these democratic societies where voices, such voices often reached very receptive audiences. Moreover, by having to adjudicate faraway conflicts on their own soil, when the Middle East conflict is suddenly carried out in the middle of Hamburg, Paris, London, or Madrid, if you want, these European states invariably, inevitably are drawn into disputes that willy-nilly involve Jews yet again, and they don't like it. Okay. Surely, of course, one needs, to, obviously, to mention Israel's deeply problematic policies and frequently objectionable, even criminal actions in the occupied territories as irritants to most European publics, elites, as well as mass. But here, too, the line between completely legitimate criticism, even vehement criticism, of policies and the much more worrisome questioning of existence need to be strictly delineated. Okay? Uh, and this is, in fact, increasingly less the case. Many people have been rightfully upset with many a country's policies, but in virtually no case that I can recall has that led to the questioning of the very worth of that country's existence. Serge Klarsfeld, the brilliant French human rights person, calls this that the Jews now in Europe have become what he calls political maranos. The maranos, of course, were the Jews that converted or were forcibly converted in the Reconquistan, in the Spanish um, uh, Inquisition period, and of course did so only actually by faith. And actually it was the, the Spanish Inquisition, because the faith alone was not enough, that you really introduce what later in the 19th century becomes racial anti-Semitism. Because clearly, if you can change faith and that's not enough, then clearly there has to be something about essence. The whole, the whole thing about the purity of blood is indeed comes from there. And the Maranos were basically people who had to declare, no, we're not Jews, we, we're, we're um, Christians. And it's in interesting, very, if you look at the debates about this, it's the only country that I know where you can often start discussions and say, well, I actually am not against Israel's, uh, I, I am for Israel's existence. I'm not against Israel's uh, um, disappearance um, as a country. Not again, as a politi policy, but as a country. Slobodan Milosevic's Yugoslavia became the bogeyman of Europe's publics. Uh, certainly after the slaughter of 8,000 Muslim men in Srebrenica, the largest single slaughter in, on the European continent since Auschwitz. But even this atrocity never led any British, French, German, or Italian diplomatic journalist writing for these countries' papers to, of record, and I'm not talking about some wacko part, uh, papers of record, to question the very right of Yugoslavia's existence as a country. Put crudely, it uh, is becoming clear by the day that the post-Auschwitz Schonzeit, as the Germans call it, basically no hunting season, um, telling using the term from hunting, again, uh, or, uh, is, um, or the off-limit season, is gradually coming to an end. The Jews, of course, are not um, off-limit anymore. Um, by constantly bringing up the truly warped and ill-willed analogy of the Israelis with the Nazis, which actually has not happened in any other conflict. Europeans absolve themselves from any remorse and shame and thus experience a hence sense of liberation. As well, one hurts the intended target by equating it with the very perpetrators that almost wiped it off the earth in the most brutal genocide imaginative, imaginable. Um, above all, um, um, all of this needs to be viewed in a comparative context, both in terms of its tone as, the, as well as its substance. Okay? As to the former, what is important here is that no other vaguely comparable conflict has attained anywhere near the shrillness and acuity as has the Middle East conflict. If one looks at two, mu two much more bloody and geographically proximate conflicts, the four succession wars following the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia and the Russian wars in Chechnya, Neither of them have even vaguely created a tone of dismissal, bitterness, and contempt of the respective aggressors, the Serbs and the Croats and the Russians, uh, among European intellectuals have Israelis, uh, as have the Israelis. I do not know of any Oxford dons uh, who were ever debating banning Russian, Croatian, or Serbian researchers from their laboratories, as actually happened repeatedly with the Israelis. Norwegian veterinarians did not refuse to send DNA samples to institutes that requested them if they were in Russia, Serbia, or any other country the way they did actually in the case of Israel. Um, 
you know, the examples go on and on and on. Uh, again, in terms of the, the, the point here, of course, has to be uh, comparative. Let me, um, let me come to the uh, last two sections, and I'll do this very, very quickly. In fact, I'll just uh, tell you so we can get to the discussion. Um, in order for me to look at the is rather than does, I collected well over 1,000 articles, and by the time I'm done, it will be sure maybe 2,000 articles, uh, on uh, the United States uh, from 1992 until 2002, in fact, excluding the conflict on, on, on Iraq. Uh, and in fact, as a political scientist, this is odd. What I'm doing is, in fact, excluding politics. Now, I understand, of course, as a child of the 60s, everything is political. I mean, you know, whether you pass the mustard or the main, it's all political, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is really macro politics. And I'm looking at how um, papers of record um, in Britain, The Guardian, The Times, The Independent, The Daily Telegraph, The Sunday Times, The Observer, in France, Le Monde, Le Figaro, Liberation, et cetera, et cetera. In Germany, of course, uh, the major papers. Uh, Italy, and I've now decided also to add Austria, uh, although, I'm not quite sure how methodologically, well, I would not have to add another small country because I won't get away with a big four, how they, in fact, report on various aspects that are not prima facie political. And in, in, in what way do they depict America or Americanization? And the coding proceeds as follows, that if um, reviewer X calls an American film terrible and says that really sucks, fine. If it, however, is constructed as, oh, the film is lousy because what can one expect? Or, in other words, if it's, again, generalizable, it is generalizing, in fact, it is then coded. Um, for instance, fascinating, you know, the, the, the word of Americanization uh, uh, in electoral campaigns. In Austria, the far-right party ran on a very successful campaign, Wien darf nicht Chicago werden. We, Vienna cannot become Chicago. Why Chicago? Why not Palermo or Liverpool or whatever? What is it about Chicago? Of course, again, the, 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 the trope is obviously uh, totally understandable to all the codes. What I then do is I look at you know, subway construction, movies, whatever, and let me just briefly mention one which is interesting, the world of soccer. The reason I'm mentioning this is because if there is an entity in the world in which the United States is an also ran, big time also ran, is the world of soccer. If you were to write the history of the 20th century about soccer, and you would not even give the United States not a quarter to footnote, it still would be a superb book. Okay. Um, so somewhere where, in fact, the United States is not powerful, has no presence, is, would not, in fact, engender any kind of fear or any kind of resentment, I look at this very carefully, and especially with the 1994 World Cup. And it's fascinating that from the get-go, there is tremendous anger about this kind of, they us you are usurping our game. You know, how can this be imposed? It's again commercialized. How can this be imposed on a country that doesn't care about this? It doesn't understand the language. It's tantamount to, in fact, holding the Winter Olympics in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay? What's the point? Why are you doing this? What is going on here? Nothing but negative assessment. Very interesting, of course, the controlling case, control case for me is the 2002 World Cup in Japan and South Korea, also not your soccer major powers. And in fact, the a priori reporting is all very, very positive. The tournament itself, by the way, is interesting. It was actually FIFA's far and away most successful tournament. Unbelievable. I think all total over the four weeks, there were 100 arrests in the United States. I think every Saturday in a Michigan football game, there were more than 100 arrests. Uh, it was a huge success, and yet, of course, constantly, again, all those things about inauthenticity, mediocrity, and so on were invoked. I'm looking at also how, for instance, Europeans looked at baseball, and how, in fact, this was completely kind of poo-pooed as this, you know, how hard can it be to hit a ball that's coming at you, and so on and so forth. So again, this re resentment. Um, just one example, e the, um, on a Wednesday afternoon, in East Rutherford, New Jersey, in Giant Stadium, Saudi Arabia played Morocco. Now, I'm not sure how well versed you are in the world of soccer, but trust you me, that's not Germany, Brazil. In other words, these are not the cutting edge uh, uh, teams. And there were 60,000 people who went. What is so interesting is if you look at the reporting, 
that it was completely seen as prima facie evidence that the Americans are dolts. Why would they see such a lousy game? Okay. An equivalent game to this in Italy in 1990 would draw 6,000 people, because of course you're in the know, you're not going to go see some uh, second-rate uh, game like this. Wonderful quip from a British journalist after the American team actually did well in South Korea. Uh, total panic. And damned if you do, damned if you don't. Quip, uh, the, the quote, this is terrible. Now the Americans are getting good at this too. They will steal our game. Imagine 11, wonderful simile here. Imagine 11 Michael Jordans running onto the pitch at Wembley. That would be the end. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Okay, it could not be more clearly delineated. When the Americans play poorly, they're irritating by dint of being aloof. When they finally join, they're irritating by dint of becoming threatening. Um, affirmative action. Fascinating stuff. How when one, especially I'm looking at the left press, one would assume there's, those, there were very few sort of progressive reforms that the United States has bequeathed to the world. One of them, I would argue, is affirmative action. It's a phenomenally important state or kind of intervention of, of, of creating or grappling with a difficult issue of individual achievement versus collective rectifying of a past wrong. It's a major, major issue, and it's being dealt with very sincerely, honestly, difficulty, whatever. This is usually attributed, I mean, the, the, the outgrowth of this is totally negative, political correctness and so on and so forth. Emmanuel Todd's article about, or, or book also about how Amer this is all American women are domineering, American universities, you can't smile anymore, there's no more flirting. Uh, it's kind of basically this austere, puritanical, um, you know, terrible place. Lastly, just very briefly, Schadenfreude, this wonderful German term. Schadenfreude, the delight in someone else's pain. 9-11 added a hitherto underdeveloped sentiment to this anti-Americanism myth, namely that of Schadenfreude. One always hears here, on this side of the Atlantic, how Europe's goodwill towards the United States immediately following 9-11 was squandered. True for the masses, absolutely untrue for the elites, who had no such goodwill to squander. Never before was the cleavage between the views of Europe's elites and its masses concerning America clearer than the immediate wake of that tragedy. Ground Zero was still burning when the first reports in the quality media okay, initiated all, kind, all the arguments, objections, analyses, conjectures, conspiracy theories, and open rejoicing that have become commonplace, that the Americans clearly had it coming to them that they fully deserved this, that this was justified payback for all of America's misdeeds from globalization to the firebombing of Dresden, by the way, often heard in Germany, but not only in Germany. But this was no big deal since many more Americans die in yearly traffic accidents, which is true, that if anything, the dis destruction of the Twin Towers improved New York's skyline, I mean, lots of aesthetic arguments, Baudrillard and others, that it was applauded by the American government to obtain carte blanche for its repressive designs, very similar to the burning of the Reichstag in the February of 1933 that led to the consolidation of the Nazi dictatorship. Again, German, but not only German. By year's end, bookstores in Paris, Berlin, and London were full of publications that basically rejoiced in the tragedy of 1911. I can give you lots of examples. And even that famous article by um, Jean-Marie Colombani, Nous sommes tous Américains, We're All Americans, if you, which he published on on, on, uh, on September 12th on the front page of Le Monde, if you read it carefully, it is, sure, we're, but it's basically all an indictment. Let me submit to you this counterfactual about which I thought a lot. Had the hijacked Air France Airbus A300 Flight 8969 crashed into the Eiffel Tower on December 24, 1994, as the Groupe Armée Islamique wanted it to, I doubt very sincerely that any, let alone numerous, American intellectuals would have published lengthy pieces in respectable publications like the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the Washington Post, whatever, by, say, let's say, December 26th or 27th, basically exculpating this crime by invoking the French atrocities in the Southeast Asia, 
the OAS massacres of Arabs in, uh, in Algeria, the Vendée, the Paris Commune, or any of the many missteps of French history. Uh, many, of course, rejoiced seeing Mr. Big suffer for the arrogance of his policies and actions, best, but above all for simply being Mr. Big. To be sure, everybody hates Mr. Big in any context, be it politics or in, in the classroom, be it Manchester United, I have a great book, Manchester United Ruined My Life, the New York Yankees, Bayern Munich, or Harvard. My first department meeting after I returned to Ann Arbor from Harvard, I said, oh, welcome, Andy, from the evil empire. Uh, okay. Alas, schadenfreude is a very human trait, which in fact gains in respectability and legitimacy when it pertains to the suffering of a perceived giant. That the widely held and vocally expressed schadenfreude and anger pertaining to 9-11 quickly shifted from Europe's intellectuals and elites to significant percentage of the population is best demonstrated by opinion polls, which clearly reveal that by the summer of 2003, for example, one third of Germans under the age of 30 believed that the US government sponsored the September 11, uh, 2001 attacks on New York and DC and Pennsylvania. About 20% of the entire German population agreed with this view according to the same survey. And what is a serious person as Andreas von Bülow, whom I actually know personally, former state secretary in SPD-led government, writes a very successful book touting these views and when conspiracy theories deeply steeped in various uh, resentments uh, are entering the mainstream in Germany and France and others, then this clearly constitutes a serious matter. Let me conclude. So what? I mean, what does this matter if, as I delineated, European elites have this um, aversion and that it's structural and it has gone on since uh, for a long time. Um, I think why this is a fascinating and important point, again just to summarize here, is that for the first time it has a mobilizing function. Europe is in fact undergoing a fascinating, again for you political science students, just please watch this because this is a unique issue of state building. You can see it before your very eyes. Money created, borders are falling, how, you know, how 18th century France became France, okay? Uh, and you can really observe this with all the difficulties. And one of the things that, of course, you also need for this is a form of affect or a commonality, okay, or, or a sentiment. At the moment, this is a, still lacking. I have the only time I've ever seen Europeans really rejoice as Europeans is in the biannual, um, uh, 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 the the um, golf tournament, uh, uh, the uh, Ryder. Thank you, the Ryder Cup with the United States. It's fascinating. It's the only time I've ever seen the European flag waved actively, okay? um, and where a German delights that an Irishman pots and in fact makes the pot. It's a great, it's a fascinating uh, issue, and I think it's in that context that if you look at the event of February 15th, 2003, which, which was the largest demonstration ever in the history of Europe, by far, okay, uh, demonstrate against the impending war in Iraq, from Athens to Berlin, from Barcelona to everywhere. It was far and away the most important uh, demonstration, which by the way, I think was a, was a very good thing, but that's irrelevant now. It is right after that um, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the former French finance minister, wrote a major article in Le Monde in which he said, let me just quote, on Saturday, February 15, 2003, a nation was born on the streets. This nation is the European nation. And this, of course, was picked up by such absolutely key intellectuals as like Jürgen Habermas and, um, and Derrida uh, and others who, in fact, are arguing that the kind of as a as a um, kind of trigger mechanism for this common, hitherto absent form of affect is indeed a form of sort of differentiating against the United States or against America or anti-Americanism, meaning that it's unclear what in fact a Swede and a Greek share. But one thing they clearly share is what they are not, namely anti-American. At the end of the day, the debate about America and the various views of and attitudes towards America by Europeans have little to do, of course, with the real existing America itself and everything with Europe. 
It is far from certain which direction the anti-American analyzed in this talk will proceed, since it remains equally uncertain where, how, perhaps even if and whether Europe will develop uh, the, the way it has begun, but I'm actually quite sure it will. But one thing remains quite telling. Nobody, nobody ever spoke of Europe's birth, okay, like after February 15th, being the fall of the Berlin Wall or the dissolution of the Soviet Union and its communist rule over the eastern half of the continent. And true enough, none of those events attained nearly the popular emotive power, the deeply emotional, ubiquitous enthusiasm that February 20, 15, 2003 clearly did. Then, in 1989-90, while Berliners danced and wept on the streets, Londoners and Parisians fretted in their homes. And I can assure you this was the case. Okay? I remember very distinctly, oh my god, a strong Germany, no, no dancing. And nobody in Europe's West thronged any public space in support of the celebrations in Warsaw and Prague. Now, whether Strauss-Kahn and Jürgen Habermas will prove correct in that this day will indeed become Europe's national holiday uh, and birthday, only future historians will be able to ascertain. One thing is clear, though. The long tradition of a deep ambivalence and antipathy towards American Europe clearly set the intellectual stage for the powerful symbolic presence of this potentially fateful day. History teaches us that any entity, certainly in its developing stages, only attains consciousness and self-awareness by defining itself in opposition to another entity. The great student of nationalism, uh, our dear friend, and again, the person who graces my chair, Karl Deutsch, reminds us that every nationalism arose in opposition to another. With the entity of Europe now being on the agenda, anti-Americanism just may well serve as a useful coagulating function, a mobilizing agent for the establishment of this new entity and become a potent political force on the mass level way beyond the elite's antipathy and resentment that has been a staple of European intellectual life since July 5, 7076, if not before. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we'll take some questions. Oh, of course. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes to take some questions. There's a microphone there for those that have an interest in asking questions. I think I spoke so long, people are leaving. <laughs> Bye. David. David. To get out yeah, first. It's fine. It's we'll fine. wait. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm sorry, I went a little too long. <laughs> was it okay? Yeah, it was really interesting. They, you don't like Bush, what? And yeah, you say you don't like Bush, but I go, okay, you're, you're okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I think there is a massive difference because, um, as I said, there's no question that the Bush administration's policies uh, and also demeanor, which, by the way, of course, feeds beautifully into the Europeans' perception of the ugly American, you know, swaggering, you know, uh, uh, cowboy, basically, which, of course, he likes to project, um, um, you know, not a particularly well-read guy, I mean, all kinds of objective reasons. And of course, the unilateralism have in fact created what I said, this kind of convergence between elite and mass opinion. But if it were only the Bush administration, the, everything else that I, did, I said uh, existed before wouldn't hold. In other words, clearly the Bush administration's policies exacerbates or kind of 
makes it much more pronounced, but the phenomenon, of course, exists. And y your question about government or, or that's, why, that's what I'm trying to separate with my is and does. Okay? In other words, the whole research is precisely, all my examples are from not the government, because I want to, if you recall, I'm trying to separate and make it possible to, if at all, you know, you can't totally separate because the two are too involved, too intertwined. But basically to look at not the government, but at soccer and at films and at subway construction. You know, uh, the Munich subway, there's this whole thing, a whole series of articles, it, whatever it will be, it should not be the New York subway or kind of this, uh, and, and again, there's good reasons why you wouldn't take the New York subway, but it again has a lot of these negative tropes. So. Uh, the very fact that, you know, uh, the way you frame the question, that of course is, is a priori a kind of a ready, kind of a certain form of exclusion. What would you say, uh, you know, what would happen if you said, uh, you know, some of the, are you married? Oh, we don't like, but I, I'm also against the Bush administration. Uh, in other words, it's already a certain form of, of, of in and out. Uh, it's like basically, if you, someone were to come here and you'd ask them uh, before you accept them, uh, you know what their particular government does. But again, the research is trying to separate the two, and I would argue that there is a huge baseline that exists way before uh, the Bush administration, massively, even already on 99. I mean, it's like way back. Yes. But you made the stereotype clear as a yes. Right. Excuse me? If, if Trump is the most powerful country, Trump right. the U.S. is the most right. powerful country, how do you separate the way that colors everyone's vision True. of it, even in soccer where we're not? Right. The fact right. is, right. because we're so powerful, we are the opposite continuum. True, but then you don't explain the history. In other words, what I'm trying to do, and that's why I spent so much in history, is when we were not powerful, this was a preoccupation. So what the point is that it's not really the real existing, I'm using that from the German wonderful, the real existieren, the real existing America, or in this case they used it in socialism, but that in fact it really is something much deeper. It's about modernity, it's about change, about other things, which have absolutely nothing to do with America, absolutely nothing. Okay? So the point, because otherwise how do you explain the 18th century? Okay? When in fact we were no threat to Britain and France, zero. How do you explain the deep anxiety about the North winning. Okay? The, 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 the French aristocracy hoped that the South would win, precisely because it was, had greater affinity to it. So it's much deeper than just being big. It is something that is big being big. The stereotype is there, and Corbyn was described that they're, they're incorporating that in this moment. In fact, wasn't that important? Did the 18th century, did the Tokyo really take the US in a deep way? Or was that just one criticism of this community country? Is it so smart? Well, I mean, I, sure, it was, uh, I mean, it didn't affect uh, immediate policy per se, but it clearly was a very important sort of thought, a very important dimension that existed in elite thought, which of course had, you know, colored, uh, views, colored uh, approach, and so on and so forth. And I, again, the point here is a critique also of modernity, and that's the link also with, 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 uh, with Jews and anti-Semitism. Okay? And, and that's where the two are anchored and have always been in this tandem. Um, yeah, go ahead. Old Europe. No, it was actually Don Rumsfeld. That's a very good question, sir. That's a very good question. Um, I actually, um, the phenomenon itself does not have any kind of different tropes. In other words, I don't think there's anything, if you look at anti-Americanism in Romania and in Britain and in Germany and in France and in Italy, they're all these exact same similarities. Now, what you're, I think what you're referring to, and there is a difference, and I actually don't have that in my sample, and I'm troubled by that. 
partly because I don't read, uh, well, I read Romanian and Hungarian, but I don't read Polish. I'd love to do that. What is very interesting is that in the new Europe, or the former Eastern Europe, there is in fact a much greater, or it's, this is a much less pronounced phenomenon for one simple reason. Because of course there, the, the, the Mr. Big, or the major object of hatred still pertains to the Soviet Union. Okay? So you're quite right that it's actually, it's different by East and West massively. And in fact, this is also played out within the EU. Okay? One of the reasons, for instance, that the Germans and the French, I actually, I didn't go into this, but the Habermas letter in, in certain ways is immensely anti-East European, and he basically pleads for a Kern Europa, a sort of a, 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 a nuclear, a, a, not nuclear, but nucleus, a, a European nucleus, okay, which should be led by Germany and France and not in fact take into account, for instance, Poland, precisely over this issue. And Poland, for instance, is often accused by many people in the EU, particularly the French, as basically America's Trojan horse. Okay, so very good question. Um, correct. Um, I think he meant it in both ways. I mean, one of them he, and by the way, it's also very typical of today's fear of America and Europe. Uh, on the one hand, an amoral society, completely commodified, inauthentic, but on the other hand, also a deeply religious one. Okay? I find it, for instance, fascinating to look at uh, some of the reviews that have come out on uh, the Mel Gibson passion. Okay. And it's interesting, it's not so much the worry of it being overly violent and anti-Semitic, but that in fact it's prime affair, it's very interesting, sort of look at its huge success. Obviously, why, you know, why do Americans go to this movie? Clearly it is, bespeaks this kind of religiosity that we enlightened Europeans have shed. And of course you understand this in terms of European history because obviously religion in Europe until after World War II was, of course, totally tied to state religion. It had you know, a much greater controlling dimension. Okay? So that Europe's secularism, its liberation, is part of this post-national response also to the horrors of the 20th century. I mean, I understand that. In other words, we have, in that sense, we really are on different, I mean, Venus and Mars, I, you know, kind of, that's an odd uh, term, but I think Kagan is not totally wrong about that even though I think some of the book is wrong, but he's not totally wrong about this because the, the, the dimensions are different. And indeed, there is this post-national, multilateral, anti-religious, secularized form, which in fact, Nietzsche himself, obviously being so opposed to religion being this idiocy, uh, actually would have welcomed. Well, you hated it, but certainly the British public didn't. You did, the intellectuals did. Certain parts of America. 
the set of most of the swans of American uh, So I wanted to watch you this, this argument is, is, is rather more complex than what you're presenting. I also wondered too, Andy, about um, presenting um, recent developments in Europe with some kind of nationalism. Because, um, and you, you quite right suggested that, I mean, the way in which we may or may, may or may not start America is historically contingent to change over the times. I mean, there are good things. I mean, Britain had very different relationships to America in the 1790s and France. Um, America represented France originally. Right. I think when the French don't like America, they think about dialect and food as much as anything else. Um, British people think about different other things, and we have that different kind of global relationship, I guess, which is kind of different, though I don't know what it is. But uh, I think different countries in Europe dislike America for different reasons. And I think your, um, your presentation is this kind of whole, this integrates the level of what European countries care about, first of all, like the French and the Koreans. So yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, look. I think, I think there's, this, um, there's a mix here which is uh, far more um, um, complex than you're suggesting. And I do not at all think that anti Americans can bond America, excuse me, Europe together in the way you're suggesting, because I think it's convenient in some respects. But I don't think ultimately it's deep enough, because there are too many differences between European countries. Sure, 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 sure. Well, um, yeah, I, I, let me take the latter part. Obviously, of course, that is not. I just. I also said it was basically a sort of the, the, it, an initial spark. Absolutely not. That will not. You can never bond only negatively, but you can. You initiate a bond through negativity, or not negativity, just the other, othering people, being different. You're not. You're. You're a because you're not b. Um, look. Uh, these sort of sub things. Um, maybe you're right. Um, I mean, I, I also differentiate between elite and mass. I have not seen, you know, again, reading all this stuff or survey research of which there is massive stuff. Uh, it is, in fact, about America. Okay, now, of course, uh, you know, you like uh, people in Liverpool love Elvis Presley, but you hate Texas. Everybody has their, you know, uh, food or. or Fine, but what is it? In fact, this is exactly my point. But what is it? It's exactly inferior, inauthentic, whatever. So you you like uh, you know the Northeast and not Texas, uh, but Texas stands for you know the the the, the prototypical <laughs> negativity. Now this is not to say that there aren't, in fact, I mean as I said, not to say you know throughout the fifth from the fifties on until. Until the ninth, until now, until the Bush administration, most European publics were more pro-American than not. I mean, I made that very clear. So, in fact, I actually hate to disabuse you. Of course, you, as a British intellectual, hated Dallas. The British public did not hate Dallas. Okay, and that's of course exactly this thing about it being attractive. This is exactly why you hate it even more. That's why the French are so upset. Is because the French go to McDonald's. No matter how lousy the food is, they are going, and the kids go, and you can't stop it. Okay? One article I called America is like pornography. Okay? It's tremendously enticing. It's vile, whatever, but it's enticing. That's exactly what was its strength throughout the Cold War. That is exactly, by the way, why, look, um, that's exactly why the Soviets hated rock music. I mean, I, I, I saw the McC McCartney uh, did a gig in Moscow in August last year. It was shown on Lifetime or whatever. And they interviewed these Russian rock guys, critics, gurus or whatever. And if you listen to them, basically in the 1960s, this was, to, and Brezhnev was right. These guys basically all argued, I mean, little hyper, you know, uh, basically a bit hyperbolically, but basically they argued almost like the Beatles brought down the Soviet Union. Okay? In other words, that in fact precisely the Kremlin's fear about this, and they didn't differentiate between the, the British, you know, the Beatles are British or not, basically it's Anglo-American or rock. Okay? It is precisely this mass culture, that's why it's a debate much larger than about America. It's about modernity. It's about the complexities of modernity. It's about mass society versus uh, elite society. It's about something uh, 
you know, uh, something dis dissolving, uh, that was exactly what rock music did. Um, I mean, I was always, I'm always fascinated by this, how these, all these state socialist societies actually became Victorian in their culture, okay? They were f scared of rock music because it in fact was American or in, in a sense of this zersetzend, this great German term, of basically sort of like acid. It kind of seeps in and it just tears it asunder and you can't do a damn thing about it. And even though you fight it, okay, it's in fact attractive. And the more you fight it, the more attractive it is. Yes, Michelle. The good United States. Absolutely. I, um, <laughs> I was in Toronto actually giving a, in October the, one of the first versions of this lecture and a uh, good friend of mine um, who teaches at uh, Hamburg was, uh, was the day on day professor in Toronto. And afterwards he came to me and said, you know, I'm so delighted in Toronto, being in Toronto because basically I'm in America but not of it. Okay? Um, it's the, you know, it's the non-threatening. I mean, who, you know, who dislikes Canada? It's, uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a one, it's, it's not Mr. Big. It, you know, it's that basically, I remember when I hitchhiked in 67 or 68, and even though, of course, I was vehement against